So this is an update on Lyme and tick-borne disease. Um, I have no disclosures, no financial arrangements, or any affiliations with any entities uh, discussed in this talk. Refreshing. Sorry? Refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the rules for the talk, I, I have some rules because in the past, uh, sometimes people like to share their stories. And I think in this setting, it's uh, best to keep um, medical advice to a medical office visit. Um, so I can't provide specific medical advice to any particular individuals. Uh, you may ask questions using the index cards in the back, and I may not answer every single question. Um, and like I mentioned before, you can provide your name and email information if you'd like a copy of the um, slides. So I currently act as the chair of the Carlisle uh, Board of Health Lyme Disease Subcommittee. Uh, I do have a private practice in Concord, and I've been treating Lyme and tick-borne diseases for a couple years. I've been treating it for a number of years, and over the past couple of years, I've been more aggressive, and I've seen really nice results, and I've seen people turn around, and this is one of the reasons I like to give talks and share this information. I want to talk to other doctors. I actually would like to give this, um, this talk maybe a slightly different um, emphasis at a local Grand Rounds to, to tell some of these specialists that all my patients are seeing what's happening with my patients and seeing what, what antibiotics actually can do for people. Um, I was, I spent medical school at NYU. Um, I did my internship and residency at the Harvard of Beth Israel Deaconess. Next slide. So why do I care personally about Lyme disease? This precious creature is my little son and he was six years old when he woke up. He came downstairs with his shirt off, of course, ate a bowl of cereal and he's these big lesions all over his body. And um, I kind of, I knew exactly what it was right away because there were these, you can see the central clearing and he had, a, and I was in disbelief. I, I was like, this can't possibly be because we know in Carlisle, it's very, very common. Lyme disease is all over the place, but to have this and um, a week prior to this or a couple weeks prior to this, he had had a febrile illness in the summer. I believe it was August and um, he was just sitting on the couch for a whole week and I blew it off because I said, oh, he has the flu, he has a virus. He's a virus. This poor kid, I kept telling him when he was a little baby, I said, oh, he's a virus. I kept blowing it off. This turns out, you know, that was the early phase. And if I treated it right then and there, if I actually had had the suspicion, which he didn't have a rash at the time, so it really wasn't on my radar. But then luckily he had this rash, and so then I acted on it. Um, but there is no such thing as the summer flu. If you have a febrile illness in the summer, it is Lyme disease until proven otherwise in this area. Uh, next slide. Uh, and these are more pictures of my son. And you can see they're very faint. Some of them are really not that perceptible. But the EM rash can actually be very different depending on the patient's skin tone and their level of histamine in their skin. And there are a lot of other factors that play a role. So just because you have a little red spot, you say, oh, I was just leaning on something. You don't have to overreact, but it may actually be an EM rash. Next slide. Um, so just going on, this is the boring slide. This is the basic history of Lyme disease. The reason I included this particular slide is because it kind of takes us back in time. A lot of people think that Lyme disease was just discovered with Alan Steer in the 1970s. When in fact, if you actually go back and look at records from the 1800s, there were several doctors that actually described these constellation of symptoms that are now recognized as Lyme disease. And um, they're a little bit different in Europe than they are in the United States. The, the symptoms and the, the strains are slightly different. The pathogenicity and the pattern of uh, symptom clusters are a little different um, depending on which uh, strain of Borrelia you get in Europe too. So then we had a few in the 1960s case reports relating it to psychiatric complaints. And now in the 1970s, the famous case of this cluster of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis discovered by Alan Steer, who is now at MGH doing his, his wonderful work on uh, autoimmune disease related to Lyme. Um, and then uh, several years later, it was actually isolated to be the specific spirochete, and that's where the name comes from, Dr. Bergdorfer. Next slide. So this picture, I like to show this because this really drives home not just the numbers of Lyme disease are actually increasing, but if you actually look at the geography, this cluster of Lyme cases is quite different from this cluster. 
So you can see how these two groups, as they start to converge, and there are more recent maps than this that I've seen where there are more and more cases kind of in the middle, these particular pathogens here and here will start to communicate and they will share their virulence factors. So when you have a Borrelia organism, it actually has these little plasmids that are extra um, genomic material that they can share with each other. So this cluster has really nasty things, like say one might cause neurologic deficits, one might, might cause ophthalmologic deficits, one might cause an inflammatory response in your joints. This group, you know, you, you have very specific strains, they're gonna start communicating. Next slide. And this is what we're looking at in the next few years with global warming as well. So we're going to start seeing a confluence of, of these factors. Um, so this looks at just the number of cases of Lyme every year. And this is an, a large underestimation. Next slide. Um, by age, you can see that there is this biphasic um, incidence here in younger, especially boys. So around five years old, you have this, this peak. And then later in like your 40s, your mid 40s, this is a typical distribution. However, in our town of Carlisle, we've actually, we're starting to look at the demographics of our own cases. And we're starting to see a peak actually in the older set of people. And I think it's because in our particular town, we have very active elderly folks. So these are people that are not just sitting knitting in their, their living room. They're out hiking, they're bird watching, they're collecting mushrooms in the woods. These are people that are very into nature. They love walking their dogs and you see them all the time out in the woods. So it really depends on behavior. And so this is just a reflection nationally. Um, this is collected by the CDC. So this is not regional. So next slide. Um, cases by month. This is the typical distribution that you see. This is again, this is a national just database. Um, you do actually see, I've seen a number of cases in November, December, and January, especially when you have these warm periods, even any, any temperature above freezing, the ticks actually are very happy to start moving and they start looking for a host. So you think you're going out in the woods when it's 40 degrees out, even if there's snow on the ground, the ticks are starting to come out already. So it really is temperature dependent. You can actually see, if you look at a tick crawling when it's 40 degrees out, it's rather slow. When it's 70, 80 degrees out, it's very fast. So the, the, the speed of a tick actually picks up with the temperature. Next slide. Um, so this is just looking at the numbers. You guys already heard this number, 300,000 new cases a year. Um, it's based on data from large commercial labs and clinician data from uh, insurance claims. So this is not based on reports. The way the CDC collects information, they actually rely on labs and doctors to submit these forms and report any kind of reportable illness. That's fine if it's something like syphilis that you really don't see very often. But when you see Lyme disease and you're running a clinic in Concord, Massachusetts, you're seeing Lyme after Lyme after Lyme after Lyme. This is not going to happen. This is not realistic. So at our Board of Health, we're looking at ways of improving this reporting system, maybe having it actually tied to the insurance claims, the, the coding that people are using, and, and labs. And finally, they are actually using this, but it's not really being used to help fund this research that should be, um, that this is deserving of. So next slide. So thinking about funding, um, you look at in Lyme disease, 25 million in 2016. Mortality was only 63. Compare that to HIV and AIDS, $3 billion in 2016. Mortality is 8,600. So that's the key difference. You really don't see too many people dying of Lyme disease, but if you actually think about all the cases of Lyme disease that progress to chronic disease and all of the sequela that people have as a result of that, that number is also underestimated. Um, so compared to anthrax, which, I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. Nobody dies of anthrax. It is a potentially very, very devastating condition. I mean, if you, if you use it for, um, for terrorism. So $56 million versus $25 million. And then Alzheimer's is certainly well-funded as well. Next slide. So this is the, the life cycle. We've all seen this. This is a very complex life cycle. It's over two years. And you see the humans, we're accidental hosts. We're like a dead-end host. Um, the, the egg star, the larva, you can actually get some diseases from the larva, but typically, not, not Borrelia though, um, when the larva matures into a nymph, most cases are actually um, gotten from either a nymphite or the adult female, mostly the nymphs, because they go unrecognized and people do not re remove them in time. So next slide. And just a note on that, um, there's a common question that people always ask me, they always say, 
does the tick really need to be attached for 36 hours, like it says in the CDC, for, to transmit disease? So for Borreliosis, it is understood that the, in the tick, the Borrelia organism lives in the midgut, and it actually has to migrate to the salivary glands of the tick to be injected into the host once it bites you. That takes approximately 36 hours. However, it is well documented that as a tick crawls on you or crawls on your dog or crawls on someone else nearby you and finds its way to its final host, it's priming. It's actually getting ready to transmit that. So the minute that the tick starts warming up and it's on a mammal, it actually senses that body heat. The Borrelia is moving towards the salivary glands. It's getting ready to to be injected into you. So it does not necessarily have to be attached for 36 hours. And so this number is set in people's heads that, oh, well, it was only on for, you know, 12 hours. We really don't know exactly how long it has to be on, and especially if it's already been primed. So this, just looking at the Borrelia spirochete, there are fossils. You can kind of make out that it looks like a tick, and inside that tick is a spirochete. So they have identified a spirochete-like organism, very similar to, to Borrelia, uh, that is 15 to 20 million years old. We, as humans, your next slide, are only approximately 200,000 years old. So you think about how complex we are. When I talk about Homo sapiens, that's the 200,000. Certainly our ancestors were also very complex leading up to us, but Homo sapiens are only 200,000 years old. Um, so really 15, 20 million years, that's a long time to evolve. And they have very sophisticated mechanisms of evading the host immune response. So next slide. So this is uh, just a description of the Borrelia burgdorferi genome. This is the, the thing, the, the strain, the B31 strain is what we think of um, when we get Lyme disease in this area. Um, so it's a linear, it's a large linear chromosome and it's actually one of the most complex genomes in prokaryotes, um, in single-celled organisms that we know of. And it also uh, has extra chromosomal elements, uh, has between 17 and 20 plasmids on average. Next slide. So the plasmids, this is what's interesting. This is rather new research that's been coming out over the last few years. The plasmids are really, people just in everyday talk, you may not know what a plasmid is, she looks so bored already. <laughs> plasmids are these tiny little circular things. So your genome, you have your genome in every cell of your body. Borrelia is just a, it's just a simple organism, and it has its genome, which it passes on to its progeny, its babies that it makes, right? But it also has these little things like trading cards these little bits of genetic information, like I mentioned earlier, that actually confer virulence and its ability to attack its host and do really nasty things to its host. So um, there is horizontal transfer, which means that when a bunch of Borrelia organisms get together, they have a party and they can exchange this information. Um, and um, let's see, yeah, they just act like tools to help them kind of manipulate the host. Next slide. And this is just a more complex picture that I don't have to go over. These are just diagrams of the, the plasmids and a Western blot showing the characteristics of the, the plasmids. Um, now looking at the phylogenetic tree of Borrelia, now we, when we talk about Borrelia burgdorferi, we're talking about Borrelia burgdorferi sensu strictu, and there's also sensu latu. These are two that we consider the causative agents of Borrelia burgdorferi in our area. However, if you look, this whole family can actually cause very similar symptoms to Borrelia burgdorferi that we think of as our Lyme disease. So you can look at Gorinii and Abzellii. Those are the two main strains that we find in Europe. And thank goodness we have seen some cases over here, but we wonder if people contracted them when they were actually in Europe um, because they're not the Ixodes scapularis tick, the tick that we find here. It, this, these particular agents do not survive well in the ticks that live here. Um, but you can see there's Borrelia miyamotoi, which is a relatively new agent. This is one that you can actually test for with your regular PCP. So when you go in and you have a negative Western blot, you have Lyme-like symptoms, you can actually say, you know what, I want you to check for Borrelia miyamotoi, because that's a newer one, and Quest does check for that, and it's, it will be processed through insurance. Um, there are a couple others that are a little more esoteric that are not available. Japonica is a newer one. Um, there's Mayonai, which is another newer one that's found mostly in the Midwest that was discovered at the Mayo Clinic. Next slide. So you can see how Borrelia species are seen worldwide and there are general distribution patterns. However, we have seen some of the Borrelia abzellii and Gorinii on migratory seabirds. 
that cross the ocean. So there is reason to think that perhaps we will see some of those strains over here, but it really hasn't taken on just yet. So most of the strains that we see here are uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Next slide. So talking about ticks, you guys have probably heard all this stuff. These are veterans that we're looking at in the audience here. You guys are already aware of a lot of this tick stuff, but I thought these were kind of interesting facts. So in a winter like this, like say you had a winter with three feet on the ground, three feet of snow on the ground, would you think that that would actually be good for ticks or bad for ticks? So how many hands for good for ticks? Okay, how many hands for bad for ticks? Okay, so this actually turns out, I mean I say it in my slide here, this turns out, this is actually good for ticks because what happens is this snow melts, those ticks are just sitting under a leaf, a pile of leaves waiting to come out. They're not being harmed by this at all. This snow will all melt, the ground will be saturated, all the leaf litter will be nice and moist. Ticks love moisture and you need to get that in your head. When you are clearing your yard and you are trying to make your habitat around your house a tick-free zone, this is what you need to keep in mind. So humidity is really the major predictor of tick populations and survival. So when you have about, uh, I believe it's eight days of, um, eight hours. I thought it was eight days. I may have, that might be a typo. So um, if you have a certain number of hours of uh, very, very low humidity, like we did have this summer, you get a massive tick die off. Um, and overwintering, like I mentioned, has really no effect on tick survival. Now this last thing on the bottom, the southern versus northern ticks. This was a fascinating study. Somebody actually looked at the behavior of ticks in the south. So say you go to South Carolina, you take ticks from a leaf litter and you transplant them up north. They're gonna hang out in the deeper layers of leaf litter. If you take the ticks that live up in New England and you put them in the south, they'll hang out near the top layers of the leaf litter. Now, which do you think are more potentially dangerous for us to contract disease? The ones that hang out near the top because we're walking or jogging by the side of the road, we touch that leaf, it'll just cling onto us, the little grabbers will grab onto our sock or our, our pants, and we'll get it, and we'll get whatever disease that thing has. So that does make a huge difference. So the transmission rate is probably less, it's, we do know just based on maps, the ticks hide in the south, they're hiding from the heat and the dryness. So that's why there is this, they're just genetically programmed to behave that way, next slide. So now this is a really, really boring section. So for the kids in the audience, um, you're brave. This is ELISA and Western blot. These are the two tests that if you go see your PCP, this is what they're gonna order. They're not gonna do any of this other stuff. This is where they stop. And they, what amazes me, I've had so many patients come to me, clinically up and down, left and right, Lyme disease, they've had five to six different specialists order the same tests over and over again. Their primary care physician has ordered the Lyme Western blot even six times. And they still, they, they know in their heart that they say this is Lyme disease, it has to be. And they check it over and over again. But this is the thing that kills me. These people, these smart doctors recognize that clinically this is Lyme disease. So they go and order this test and it just, it just kind of confirms to me that you know it reminds me how terrible these tests are and people doctors very much so rely on tests because they think they're good because most other tests are pretty good this test is not good so we have a two-tiered testing system in the united states that has that was established about 12 years ago by the cdc and the infectious disease society of america and there are a lot of reasons that they chose the specific criteria that they have, but they're very stringent. And they were originally designed for epidemiologic purposes, not for clinical use. However, doctors nowadays use it for clinical decision making, which is not necessarily the best for the patients. So the things at the bottom, these are other um, little more sophisticated methods of testing. PCR, you're only gonna have positive early in the infection. It's not gonna be helpful after a few weeks. Um, fish is also low yield. Um, you can do antigen testing if you have joint fluid or your um, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, the culture, this is the thing that, that kills most infectious disease docs especially. When you have a bacterial infection, you go into the hospital, you basically, if you, so say you have a fever and you, you look septic, 
they'll do blood cultures, right? And they identify what is growing in your blood. The, the culture is the gold standard for most infectious diseases. Unfortunately, because Borrelia is, number one, very fastidious, it is a very, very difficult to grow organism on any culture medium. So that is, is the first one. But you also have to understand that the culture, it's even in early disease where you're teeming with spirochetes is nearly impossible. So when, when docs say that you know, you've had symptoms for six months after two courses of doxycycline, it can't possibly, because you're not, you're not growing anything out of your blood, you can't possibly have a bacterial infection. Yes, you can, because there really is no gold standard for Borreliosis. Um, and then this is an interesting new, um, new concept, is xenodiagnosis. I did mention this in my last talk in Carlisle. Is there's a, um, a doctor, Dr. Linden Hu at Tufts, who's actually enrolling patients right now, if you're interested, um, taking clean ticks, putting them on your skin. If you have negative testing up until, you know, over and over again, and you clinically believe you have Lyme, he'll take clean ticks. And what's interesting is those clean ticks that are naive, will, they'll let them sit on there for a number of hours. They'll remove them, and then they'll test those ticks, and they'll be positive for, for Borrelia. So there has to be some kind of signal that is happening. The ticks, when they're attached, they say, okay, Borrelia, time to wake up. Time, just like within the midgut of a tick, it knows when it's time to wake up and move on to propagate itself. So this is a newer approach. I personally don't recommend this because when you take a tick, where are you getting that tick from? It's not like it's a biologically engineered tick, it's a tick. And who knows what that thing is gonna be injecting into you. So, I mean, unless you're really desperate, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. And, uh, uh, so CD57 and C4A are some more sophisticated tests that we do on some patients with very questionable tests and we just put the pieces together. And then this is other, another assay that is very interesting. This is, I'm totally losing the kids, <laughs> totally falling asleep right now. Ellie spot eye spot testing, this is pretty cool. I send this off to Germany, however, a bunch of patients didn't make it in time, so I apologize to them. There is a, there is a, company in Wisconsin in the United States that does do it too, but it's a little more expensive. And so that is something I've been using for some of my folks that are coming back negative with the Western blot. Next slide. So this again goes through the two tier test and you've heard this a million times. You do the ELISA and then the Western blot. I don't even do the ELISA because I just find that it's, it's not helpful. Um, if you clinically are coming to me and you have Lyme symptoms, I'm gonna do the Western blot and then I'll go from there. Next. Uh, two tier limitations, um, we already talked about this, but uh, it's indirect, you're measuring antibodies. So when you have Lyme disease, your antibodies are depressed because your immune system is depressed. Um, and uh, you also will have a false negative in the early stages of disease. So this is what's interesting, in persistent disease or chronic Lyme disease, you will have between 80 to 60, 18 to 16% sensitivity. That means you're missing most people who actually have Lyme disease. Um, and uh, so this, neither of these, the ELISA or the Western blot, actually are sensitive enough to be used as a screening tool, even though they currently are. Next slide. Um, and this is just a picture of the Western blot, but this just shows you what it is. The, the thing I wanted to point out here is that you can see how this is not a yes, no kind of answer. This shows you this is a positive band. This might be an indeterminate band, and they have controls. So this is the control, and they compare it to what's over here. And it's really subjective, but the thing I like about this is you can actually use this and interpret it in the context of the person sitting in front of you. So if the person sitting in front of you has a million different symptoms consistent with Lyme disease, they're one of these people that's seen 10 different specialists who have also checked for Lyme disease several times, and then you have an indeterminate Western blot, it might just be that that person has low levels of immunoglobulins and they're just not mounting an immune response to have a robust re, um, result on their Western blot. So what I find in a lot of patients like this is I'll check them a little bit after they've received initial treatment and their immune system is starting to kick in again and then they'll have a positive test. So that's, it's, it's very interesting. It can be expensive because if you start repeating these tests, it can be very pricey. Um, let's see, yes, subjective I mentioned. Um, and then some laboratories like Igenix in California actually measures a few extra bands there's a 31 and 34 kilodalton band, which I'm totally losing. You guys are probably all falling asleep right now, aren't you? Um, the 31 and 34 were excluded from the, the decision by the CDC years ago because those were the two bands that were included in the vaccine. 
that was created back in 1998. Um, so those are very, very Lyme specific bands. And now I personally look at them because I've had one patient have the Lyme vaccine. Almost nobody has had the Lyme vaccine. Um, and then um, there is also this discrepancy of IgG or IgM. This I'll save for my doctors. I won't bore you guys. This is really boring. Um, sensitivity and specificity, again, the main take home point is if you look at the test for HIV, the sensitivity is 99.6% and 100% specificity. That's a good test. That's what most tests are like. That is what most doctors are used to interpreting when they get a yes, no answer on their test. So when you go see your PCP and they get your Lyme test back and they say it's negative, they say, okay, it's negative. And they just go on there. It's not that simple. It's not that easy because you can see the Lyme sensitivity, this is for persistent disease, is between 44 to 50%, 56%. That's, that's not okay. The specificity is good. So if it's positive, you're pretty darn sure that it's actually accurate. All right, next slide. Um, again, the same, this is the same numbers. This is just showing that this is Alan Steer's work, which he's one of the big um, kind of proponents for this post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome um, and against the concept of per persistent Lyme disease that's treatable with antibiotics. So that's, what's interesting is his work is actually kind of confirming the, the, the poor quality of this, this particular test. Next slide. Um, and I mentioned this before, we really, really don't know the true prevalence of uh, Lyme disease, incidence or prevalence. Um, next slide. Now, this is just a list of recommended labs. This is something, if you want to sign up for the, the slides, I'll send this to you, and you can use this if you want it. Even, you can ask your regular doctor, say, look, I, can you, if you have a good relationship with them, say, can you order this test through Igenix? And they might. I've, I know a lot of people, a lot of my patients, they have really nice primary care doctors that care about them, and they want to learn more about it, but they just don't know how. So this might be a good way to start. You can just do the Igenix or um, Armin Labs, and um, that might be a nice place to start. Next slide. Um, so the question of why is the medical community divided? Um, so first off, when we think of Lyme disease and when you're taught about Lyme disease in medical school, you're thinking early disease. You're thinking the rash, the swollen knee, Bell's palsy. It's very textbook. It's very simplistic. That's not what doctors learn. They don't learn about the late disease. So it's kind of like syphilis. If you look at syphilis early on, versus later, they're very, very different. And um, it is a very similar kind of infection in that it can just be a low grade, very hard to detect, um, and actually very difficult to treat and slow growing infection. Um, and as I mentioned before, technically difficult um, testing and no true gold standard. Um, so next slide. The um, typical manifestations of early Lyme so none of this really is that early. This, I would have to say, somebody asked me at my last lecture, um, they were all confused because I mentioned one of these things, like even the knee, I said was kind of early. There's early, meaning confined to the skin, and then within days, it really does disseminate rather quickly. Um, so the rash is really, if you have a rash, you should feel blessed because that is the only way that you're gonna catch it really, really early and treat it right away. Um, and I'll get to that about treatment with that. I'm becoming more aggressive with treatment, even with early Lyme, because a good percentage of those people, even if they're treated appropriately, they do go on to having persistent symptoms. Um, and then the facial palsy, generally speaking, we see that in the first few months. Even cardiac disease, you usually see it rather early on, um, except for the cardiomyopathy that you can see a little bit later on. And then the swollen knee, the monoarthritis, which I have several patients who've been seen by rheumatologists and all they have is a big swollen knee and they live in Massachusetts and they're being given methotrexate and they're being given immunosuppressives and it just, it breaks my heart. Um, next slide. So these are just examples. I'm gonna blow through this because I know you guys are familiar with this rash thing. This is the typical rash. This is easy, right? That's a no brainer. This is just probably not focused, but sometimes it really doesn't look like the targetoid lesion. Next slide. Um, so see this one, this isn't someone's armpit. Um, it's confluent, it's just a solid red thing. And somebody might say, oh, it was just because I was sweating or I was leaning against something. It's, and this one actually, unfortunately, I don't know if you can see it, it's really faint. Um, but you can barely make out the circle. A lot of these EM rashes are just circles. They're not targets. And that's what doc doctors, most doctors know that. A lot of patients don't know that, so they don't know to go to their doctor. If you have any weird rash, 
if your friend, if your cousin or your uncle, tell them to take a picture of it. You, everyone has a phone, just take a picture. Next slide. Um, and this one is on a little, I think it's a little girl. Um, you can barely make out this little arc. And so you could see how it wouldn't necessarily look like an EM rash. Next slide. Um, and this is another patient where you can see how it's a massive circle. And it's, she's probably bit on the back of her head. Um, and this is another just a confluent circle. Next slide. Um, next slide. This is just another example of that. Now, this is slightly different. When you have a single rash, that's typically right where the tick bit you. That's very, very early. When you start to have this multiple rash like my, my son had, that means that it's really disseminated, and then you really, really need to be more aggressive with treatment. So this particular person, they probably have Borrelia teeming just about in every organ by now. So it's, it really spreads rather quickly. Next slide. So the two camps, this is one thing that a lot of patients come to me, and they don't understand. They're so confused because the 10 different doctors are telling them different things, and they just their head is spinning. So this is what I want to drive home. Doctors are not in agreement about this at all. So there is the ILADS group over here where they believe that there's an actual infection, an ongoing infection. You treat that aggressively with antibiotics. There is the IDSA or CDC, which I do have to say more and more conferences that I go to, I'm starting to see a little bit of mix. You see the same, you know, the research is coming out to support the ILADS viewpoint. So some of the researchers, such as Dr. Zhang at Hopkins and Dr. Brian Fallon at Columbia and, and Eva Sapi at New University of New Haven, they are actually lecturing at some of these IDSA conferences. So it's, there is some communication, so hopefully within the next decade there will be some consensus. But right now it's mostly the testing that's causing a problem. So that's why I spend so much time talking about the, the poor testing. Next slide. Um, so looking at early versus late, we, we mentioned flu-like symptoms, bullseye rash. That's pretty much it for early. Other than that, you're, you're, you're kind of in big trouble. Um, so the list is very long, and I have a whole other page of symptoms. It is ridiculously long, and if you were to show this list to a primary care physician, they would laugh because they would say, that's all my patients. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, Lyme disease is really, really common. And so you need to start really thinking about the person that comes in with, you know, tooth pain or, you know, I have a lot of patients who come in with lockjaw or um, even just IBS symptoms and just overwhelming fatigue. I don't think that my patients are making stuff up. People don't want to come see me and spend time sitting in my office. It's not fun for them. And doctors treat patients like they're all hypochondriacs when they come in with this long list of symptoms. Next slide. So you can see how it goes on and on, and you can have ear buzzing and tremors. It's really about pattern recognition more than anything else. When I go through my symptoms list and I see a good number of these symptoms, my suspicion for Lyme disease is very, very high. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, none of my patients are crazy. They, they can be demanding. They can be needy because they've been turned away by the, the mainstream medicine. But they're not them are crazy. They, they are telling me. I am having this weird pain right here, and I've seen 10 ENTs, and no one knows what's wrong with me. So, and I, I see that all the time, too. So people come with ear pain, nothing wrong with their ears, and it goes away with treatment. So you can see it affects your thyroid. And these, some of these are a little more serious, myocarditis, endocarditis. That's a little more obvious if you do an EKG and echocardiogram. But, um, you know, even a lot of people come in with forgetfulness, mood swings, trouble speaking. I don't know how many people think they have dementia. They come in with garbled speech. They actually say, I speak for a living, and I can't talk. And they do respond to therapy. So next slide, please. Uh, again, pattern recognition. These are some of the more obvious red flags. If you have migratory joint pain, that is a red flag for Lyme disease. Uh, POTS is this syndrome where you see someone when they stand up they get very dizzy and sometimes you'll get nystagmus your eyes flicker um, and if you actually check their blood pressure and their pulse you can ask your pcp to do these things say do orthostatics on me see if i have pot they're gonna think you're nuts but um this i see in a lot of my patients and it does respond to therapy it does respond to salt therapy even just putting extra salt on your food but just make sure you don't have high blood pressure to begin with though so before you do that um, treatment resistant insomnia, menstrual irregularities. I've seen a number of women in their 40s who think they're menopausal, 
they get treatment, they get their period again. So they do have to be very careful if I'm treating them with antibiotics that could be potentially teratogenic to an unborn fetus. They could very well get pregnant. So this is something that I, I have seen a number of people get their period back. Um, and then, like I mentioned, lockjaw is this really interesting thing I've seen in a number of patients. And it's not written in the medical literature anywhere associated with specifically Lyme disease. Next slide. Um, so these are the specialists that I would love to, I, I mean, actually every day I come up with more and more specialists that, that I think are on my hit list, but I would love to give them a talk similar to this and kind of just give them a little primer and, and show them, maybe do some case reports so they don't have to come to me. Like if, if a rheumatologist or a neurologist can recognize this and say, you know what, you have Lyme. You have a negative Western blot, but I think you have Lyme. Let's treat you this way with this, this, and this gastroenterologists all the time, I don't know how many patients have come to me with this strange pain in their belly. They've had this massive workup, colonoscopies, ultrasounds, you name it, CAT scans, everything's negative. And then as you treat the Lyme disease, it actually gets better. Next slide. So again, why is it so hard to diagnose and treat? Next slide. Um, it really knows how to hide. So this is a good one for the kids in the audience. I'll let you can you find where the bug is? Do you see it? No? So this is a leaf bug. Do you know what a leaf bug looks like? It looks like a leaf. So it's that little guy in the front, and it's hiding. He's just hiding in plain sight. So this is kind of what Borrelia does. It takes, next slide, it takes the uh, proteins from your own white blood cells, and it takes little bits of you know, lymphocyte proteins and it sticks it on its, its behind so that when the other white blood cells come looking for it, they say, oh, you're one of us, that's fine. So it has these very sneaky ways of evading your host's immune system. Um, it also lowers your own body temperature by means of um, altering your thyroid and pituitary function. Um, and it directly attacks lymphocytes and macrophages as well as natural killer cells. These are white blood cells that will normally attack bacterial infections. Um, uh, similar to something like HIV. So you can think of it as one of the major ways that it actually causes pathology is by directly attacking your own immune system. Next slide. Um, so the other way that, the other ways that it has evolved to avoid our host defenses is it has very, it, it changes forms. The most active form is the spirochete. That's the thing you see pictures of. It swims, it actually goes into cells, it goes into tissues, it can go into just about any tissue in your body. Then you have the cystic form. When you are treated, so say you have the EM rash and you're treated with two or three weeks of doxycycline, all of your Borrelia is gonna go into the cystic form and it's gonna hide and it's gonna wait until that doxycycline is gone. And then guess what? It's gonna come out to play after the doxy is gone. So that's why you get resistant disease. So the cystic, the cystic form as well as the biofilm. So the biofilm is essentially like a castle under siege. It's just another kind of like when you brush your teeth at night and you feel like before you start brushing, there's a little slime layer. That's bacteria. You, it's everywhere. It's in your kitchen sink. It's, it's just anything that's like that slimy layer. That's a biofilm. Every kind of bacterium that we know forms a biofilm. So the, the Borrelia kind of just goes like this. And so when you're throwing antibiotics at it, it's just getting the stuff on the outside, not all this mass of stuff on the inside. So there are specific ways of affecting the biofilm, and I'll get to that in a second. As, and then the intracellular form, that's another, this is less well recognized by the mainstream. Biofilm, cystic, and spirochete, this is well established. This is known by the CDC and the IDSA. Intracellular forms are, are just emerging. This is newer evidence that supports this. Next slide. So this is Dr. Eva Sapi's work um, showing the biofilm forms. And this is one of the reasons why prolonged treatment regimens are often necessary. So it basically congeals with these mucopolysaccharides. It's like sugars that keep it together and actually binds in this like really tight woven um, unit. And this is also where they exchange genetic material. So they can kind of get nastier and angrier as you go through. Go on. Next slide. Um, so this co-infections are another reason that we have trouble treating Lyme disease. And if you think about co-infections, they're really more the norm than the exception. Imagine taking, I heard this, I'm gonna steal this from another talk. Um, I went to some conference and this speaker said, imagine taking a hypodermic needle and injecting it, taking blood from a rat in the New York City subway. 
and then taking more blood from another rat, from 100 different rats, and then injecting it into you, what kind of pathogens do you think you'd see? <sighs> Who knows? I mean, that's what ticks are. That's essentially what a tick does. It basically is just sucking blood and it shares that. It basically will go onto a mouse and then a deer and all those parasites and pathogens, they're just kind of hanging out there and then they're coming back all at once. This is all we know of. There are probably so many parasites that we're completely unaware of and that's why one of the um, problems with current treatment regimens is they don't necessarily address parasitic forms. Um, so Babesia, we all know about Babesiosis, Anaplasma, Aurelichia, Bartonella. Bartonella is not as well recognized as a co-infection in this area, I mean just in general by the IDSA, but it is documented in a lot of patients who have Lyme disease um, and it causes very severe symptoms. Uh, Rickettsial disease, I've been seeing a lot of Mycoplasma and Chlamydia in a lot of my patients as well. Um, and then we have a lot of these viral illnesses. These aren't necessarily co-infections, these are more possibly reactivation. So when you get an infection with Lyme, infections that are already there from when you were five, maybe you had Epstein-Barr when you were five, which 95% of the world's population has antibodies to Epstein-Barr. So when you suppress your immune system, these things come out to play. Similar to if you were to get a liver transplant, you take immunosuppressives, all these old infections, varicella zoster, when you had chickenpox as a kid, it's gonna come out to play again. So, um, that just complicates treatment and um, if you think about how they've evolved, they've probably evolved to work in concert to suppress your immune system and kind of work together. Next slide. Um, so these are just examples of two common co-infections that we see. Um, Babesia uh, is typically manifested as uh, fatigue. I've actually been seeing a lot of patients, I'm just checking everybody for it now because I've been seeing people with no symptoms come back positive Babesia. And so it is a different, slightly different treatment protocol um, than Lyme disease. Um, typically they'll have night sweats. They'll have this sensation that they need to sigh all the time. Sometimes they'll have anxiety or chest pain, this feeling that maybe they're underwater. Um, Bartonella, this is a really tricky um, infection to treat and it can have very, very nasty symptoms. Um, it can manifest with severe psychiatric symptoms. Sometimes people will end up in psychiatric hospitals uh, because of the Bartonella infection. Sometimes people have dementia, they have severe eye symptoms, um, prominent stretch marks. So these can be nice warning signs. So if you have foot pain, prominent stretch marks, those are kind of red flags that maybe we should check for Bartonella. Keeping in mind that both of the antibody testing for these things are very insensitive. So sometimes you have to go through a cycle, you have to check it a couple times. Sometimes you have to send it off to specialty labs. Next slide. Uh, treatment options, this is kind of just more for doctors, but you basically early, you have doxycephuroxime and amoxicillin, and to be honest, when I see early disease, I'll throw in some Plaquenil to cover the cystic forms, because when I start giving the doxy, I'm gonna be inducing the cystic forms, so I, I cover them for both. Um, and... Um, wait, wait, the Plaquenil is... Oh, that's this, Plaquenil is hydroxychloroquine, and it's typically used by um, rheumatologists for rheumatologic disease but it's an antiparasitic and it works well for the cystic form. Um, so I use a combination of antibiotics in just about all of my patients and um, I try to treat the different forms. You really have to experiment with some people because some people have allergies, some people can't tolerate it because of nausea and sometimes you really need to back off if people have a very strong Herxheimer reaction which is a die off. So other treatment options, these are a little atypical. So when you see a regular doctor, they might do some antibiotics and every Lyme doctor that you see is gonna have a slightly different background. What they bring to the table is gonna be a little different. So with some of my patients, I use low-dose naltrexone, which is a really nice anti-inflammatory. So a lot of the manifestations of Lyme disease and this, these co-infections are from this exaggerated inflammatory response. So when you give low-dose naltrexone, it actually is, it's a novel, um, glial cell modulator. So it actually affects your systemic inflammation. So I use that on a lot of my autoimmune patients as well. Probenicid sometimes just to boost the efficacy of the antibiotics. Cholesteramine sometimes I'll throw in if someone has exposure to uh, mold or has evidence of mycotoxin um, response to mold. Hormone replacement if you're deficient, antidepressants, and sometimes chelating agents <clears throat> if you have heavy metals. Um, then these are some non-prescription options that I do prescribe to most of my patients. These are the ones I typically use. I have another slide with dozens more, but these are the ones that I find to be very useful um, in my patients. Fish oil curcumin, 
are the biggest bang for your buck in terms of anti-inflammatory power. Um, and then serapeptase, stevia, these are anti-biofilm, grapefruit seed extract is anti-cystic um, form. Loracidin is also another good one. So these you can see, I throw these in in addition. So when people come to see me, unfortunately, anyone who's been to see me, I'm not going to name names here, you're going to be taking a hunk of pills every day, twice a day. But it's a lot of it is this stuff, and it actually does, it, it really has a huge, huge effect. These, these herbals are actually very effective. Nice, next slide. So scary fact, I think I mentioned this before, about 10 to 50% of patients who are treated properly actually go on to have persistent disease. Um, the current guidelines recommend only 10 to 21 days of a single antibiotic, and Borrelia has a four-week life cycle. So that means that if you are treating it, it might actually revert into the cystic form, and then if you don't treat it for that four weeks, you're going to miss the boat. So you really do need to treat sometimes six weeks, even with an early infection. Next slide. Um, so these, this is not easy to treat. I just want to give you a sense of you can do herbal stuff at home. There, if you actually look at, took a whole group of people from New England, and actually if we had a really good test, I would say a good chunk of those people actually have Lyme disease and they're walking around and they have no problem because their immune systems are intact. Their immune systems can keep it at bay. So there are a lot of things I'm going to get to in just a second that actually help support your immune system that are just common sense that have, and I've seen this firsthand with all of my patients, have a huge impact on how you actually feel. Um, so these are some of the approaches that I use, prolonged antibiotic treatment, combination antibiotics, treat the co-infections, and then you treat associated conditions such as insomnia, uh, vitamin D deficiency if you have any psychiatric problems, if you have mercury toxicity, IgG deficiency, I've been seeing that in a number of patients as well, and then mold and mycotoxins. The mold and mycotoxins, those are some of the toughest patients to treat. If you are treating with antibiotics, you're not getting better. I often, I will see a lot of um, mycotoxins in people, and it's like an allergic reaction to exposure to molds. And the problem is it's either at their work or their home, so it's very difficult for them to remove that for themselves from that situation. Um, and these are a number of herbs and supplements, and I'm not going to go through all these, but there are several books, and I, I think I may have these listed uh, books, references on my website. Um, Dr. Stephen Buhner is a nice resource if you're into herbs and, and natural remedies. Um, he's very, very um, experienced at treating this. The Byron White formulations and Cowden, Cowden Protocol are also very effective, um, and I will use those, and I'll rotate those in for people that can't tolerate antibiotics. Next slide. Um, now, post-exposure prophylaxis, I don't know if the word is out yet. A lot of people are still actually doing this, I think. This was a few years ago. The CDC was actually recommending to give people one or two doses of doxycycline after a tick bite. That's not a good idea. The reason is it actually uh, reduces the future accuracy of tests um, because you will abrogate the host immune response and you will not form antibodies to Borrelia. Um, and it basically has only shown to reduce the formation of the EM rash, which as we have figured out, we really want to have that EM rash so that we actually know what's going on and we have proof and a doctor will actually treat you if you have that EM rash. Next slide. Um, this is just practical advice. We were talking with somebody just a second ago about how to tick proof your yard. Um, this we've done at our house and it works really, really well. We used to have, we have two dogs. They used to come in covered in ticks and there'd be ticks sitting on our couch. It's disgusting. Like I have a jar back there with probably 200 ticks that we've collected over the past, you know, five to 10 years. And um, having just this tick-free zone, clearing leaf litter makes all the difference. So in Carlisle, Bedford, it depends on where you live, but certain woody areas, you really need to make this a priority. Even if you have to cut some trees down, clear at least a zone around your yard. If your dogs are playing, if your kids are playing, and make sure the swing set is far from the tick zone. So leaf litter and wood piles, you want to keep uh, your, your activity away from there. Um, absolutely no bird feeders. I'm sorry. I, I have no mercy. I, bird feeders are just, they're a magnet for birds. If you ever look at Google birds and ticks, when you get home, they're pictures of birds covered in ticks. They just drop ticks. They're, they're a great carrier for ticks. Ticks really don't walk very far. They, they travel on birds. So absolutely no bird feeders, and um, do not let your cat outside. Please, if you have a cat, just keep them inside. I know they like to go outside. Do not do that, and don't let your dog sleep in your bed or your cat. Um, next slide. So this is one of my favorite things, permethrin spray. It's super toxic to just about everything, including humans, but you don't have to put it on your skin. 
You spray it on your shoes. If your kids have shoes, you have shoes, right? Just spray it like on the bottom. So when the tick actually, what I love about this, when the tick crawls, if it touches the permethrin, it will die before it can transmit most of the diseases. There are a few diseases such as Powassan virus that can be transmitted within 15 minutes of biting you, but don't worry about that. That's, you worry about the, the other big stuff. This will kill most of the ticks if it just crawls on this. So I love permethrin. You can even spray it on your socks and then let them dry. Ticks are usually on grass. Sometimes if you have higher grasses, but basically they're coming from below. So if you spray your shoes, you spray your socks, you should be good. Um, and the bottom of your pants if you do yard work. Um, these are tick tubes. This is a brand name, but um, there are ways of illegally doing it yourself um, that you can look online. Um, because it's, I think it's a pesticide. You're not supposed to be handling pesticides. So it is, it's really easy if you do buy the tick tubes. It's just essentially like a toilet paper roll with cotton balls with permethrin in them. And the, um, the mice that live in your wood piles around your house, they will take these cotton balls and put them in wherever they live. And they, they take them really fast. And it kills all the ticks, which is great. And it does, there have been studies looking at whether or not this actually decreased the tick density and they've been inconclusive, they haven't really shown much, but we just anecdotally, people in town, we've actually used it ourselves, we find that it does seem to help. Next slide. Um, and this is my favorite tick scooper. I love the, the tick off, it's patented. So I, I just, what I love about it is when you scoop it off, it can be tough for ticks that are really embedded, but what's nice is you're not squeezing the tick and they always recommend not to squeeze the body because you can actually be forcing the contents of its midgut into you. And so that's not good. Next slide. I just like these pictures because um, you can see this guy. There's, I forget what it's called, but they actually have a certain stance where they actually use their third and fourth legs. And they'll actually, and I've seen when Questing. we were, what is it? Questing. Questing, yes, thank you. Um, when we were in Martha's Vineyard, they were on every blade of grass. And I kid you not, there was a warning sign. And we said, oh, we're going to go for a hike anyway. They were like this. And we were, I mean, other people were just marching through. and. They were literally on these big blades of grass, sitting there questing, and you could see them with their arms waiting in their little hooks. This, you can actually see the hook ready to go. And all you need to do is just brush by it. And it catches under your leg, you don't even know. And then a few hours later, it's found its way to a nice, warm, happy place. Next slide. Um, so areas of future research, um, they're looking into genetically engineered mice. I do not know what the current status is of that. I, I believe there was an article in the New York Times about it a little while back. And I think on NPR they had a piece about it. But um, I don't know. They were, they're trying to get approval from communities about doing this. So what they're trying to do is design mice that are resistant to Borrelia, at least, and have it. they design the genetic change to be finite. That means after so many generations, it actually fades out. So on the one hand, they can make money by s selling these mice back to these towns because it'll work, right? But on the other hand, you're not going to have these scary mice that become, you know, genetic monsters. So it's it's a finite thing. It kind of it weans its, itself out. But anything, anytime you do genetically engineered anything, they have to get approval, and it's it's very contentious. Um, they're looking into a new Lyme vaccine. So this is something, it's, it's a much more sophisticated vaccine than the one that was brought out in 1998. They actually have very smaller areas of um, antigenicity, so it's not going to stimulate this robust autoimmune response like the, the previous one, but they're, they're, it's actually under trials right now and they're, they're, it's not available yet. Um, except for dogs, there, is, there are more modern versions of the older vaccine for dogs, not for humans. Um, there are mouse vaccine bait boxes that have mixed results. And the urine nanotrap antigen testing, I have not heard the update on that, but the last conference I went to that was still in the process of getting FDA approval. Next slide. Uh, this is just a picture of xenodiagnosis. This is from um, Dr. Hu at Tufts. Um, you can see a little patch of ticks on your arm, and you can see when they're about to remove them. Um, and he is looking for patients, so if you're interested, you can contact him at Tufts. Uh, tick testing, this is something I do recommend for people because I've had a number of uh, friends, patients, neighbors who sent off a tick, especially on kids where you, you really have to be very careful with their tiny little livers and their little kidneys throwing antibiotics at them. Um, if it comes back, you go to UMass, they have a great website. It's about $50 for some of the major pathogens. I think it's, it's babesiosis, anaplasma, 
uh, lime and maybe one other one but it's a pretty good deal and you can add more for a little bit more money um, and the results come back within I believe within a week it's pretty fast it's a good turnaround um, the Bay Area Lime Foundation has offers free tick testing we did that a couple months ago it took it took three months to come back so it's not going to really change your management too much but if you were to get a positive test on say one of your kids or something um, through the UMass thing, you might actually bring that to your pediatrician. And I've seen people treat based on that because we really don't know what the transmission rate is. And I think it, to err on the side of just a course of, of uh, amoxicillin, most pediatricians would probably be amenable to that. Next slide. So FAQs. What percentage of deer chicks carry Lyme? Why are doctors so hesitant, his hesitant to treat Lyme? Can you catch Lyme all year round? So I'll just, the percentage of deer ticks, I'll get to that. I have a couple slides coming up to kind of go over that just locally. Um, what are doctors, why are they so hesitant to treat Lyme? Um, a, we have something called a medical license. And when you go against the grain, i.e. the CDC or the IDSA, and you, even if you know in your heart of heart that you're right, there's that risk, it's dangerous. So that's why ILETS was formed for doctors and there's more legislation. Massachusetts is actually one of the better states to protect doctors who treat Lyme disease. Um, but there are, there's, there's a lot of, um, disbelief that persistent Lyme disease even exists. So um, can you catch Lyme all year round? Absolutely. Why is there so little federal funding for Lyme disease research? Um, and that's a question that I, I'm not really sure why. Um, it may have something to do with the perceived mortality rate being so low. It's not communicable from one person to another um, that we know of. There's it looks of doubt. It, there have been thoughts of um, Lyme disease being a sexually transmitted disease. We don't, we don't think that it exists in um, bodily fluids at high enough concentrations to, to be transmitted that way. Um, but that's, the jury's out on that one. Um, and why are the tests for identifying? It's, we've already talked about the, the host evading the host immune responses. It's very complex. Um, and why is there a vaccine for dogs and not for humans? I think it really has to do with the... Um, the litigiousity of people and the fear of drug companies putting things out before they're really, really, really ready for humans. So when you actually look at veterinary medicine, they're, in a lot of respects, especially with regard to tick-borne disease, they're worlds ahead of us because they can actually do experiments on their, their subject matter, which humans, we can't do that. Um, next slide. So these are, uh, this is from the UMass lab and they test a whole bunch of tests. This is all throughout the United States. You can see how just Borrelia species in general, about 48% of the ticks brought in there were uh, positive for Borrelia. And this I just checked like two or three days ago. So this is pretty up to date. Um, if you look at Borrelia burgdorferi, it's about 30%, and then Babesia, almost 5%, Anaplasma, about 5 Next slide. Um, now remember these numbers, because now we're looking at Massachusetts. It's up to 54% or 55%. And Borrelia burgdorferi is about 32. But if you think about Borrelia species, all of those can cause Borrelia-like symptoms. So essentially, they can all cause the same bad stuff. Um, so you can think of that number being about 50. Half of ticks in Massachusetts can give you Lyme disease. Um, and then Babesia, about 6%. Anaplasma, about 6%, or 5.5. OK, next slide. Now looking at Carlisle, I don't know what's going on in Carlisle, but 70% of the ticks positive for Borrelia species. That's really high. I've never seen a number that high. The last time I checked, it was probably last spring, it was in the order of maybe 50 to 60%. It was, it was, it was, it was significantly lower. Um, Babesia up to eight and now anaplasma seven and a half. Next slide. Um, the Lyme vaccine, we already talked about the, the autoimmune response and um, there's a newer vaccine preparation that is less of a trigger um, for autoimmunity. Next slide. Um, I think we talked about most of these. Um, the concept of it being a new disease, this is something, if you think of Lyme disease as emerging in the 1970s, it really is a new disease to us. It's, it was kind of identified in the 1880s or the 1800s, um, but it really, there hasn't really been a concerted effort to really investigate this, like there has been for things like tuberculosis. And I think that's where we are. We're at the stage where with tuberculosis, the treatment is a year to 18 months. 
And so that's what we're looking at for persistent Lyme disease. And we really, doctors and scientists have to really come up with a working protocol and a standard of care for that. Um, and um, like I mentioned before, next slide. Um, so this is what I recommend. If you think you have Lyme or co-infections, get a standard Western blot from Quest or LabCorp. Your insurance will pay for it. it come, if it comes back positive, great. But keep in mind that it, it can be a very poor test. Next slide. Um, what if it's negative? Consider using Igenix, which they use two strains of Borrelia, and they also use two extra bands. Um, consider the, the I-spot or the, um, the LE-spot, uh, which are considerably, they're more expensive than free, um, which you would get through Quest. And, um, but if you have an answer, you have an answer, which would be nice. Um, and then also consider testing for co-infections through your regular labs. Your PCP can order these tests. Um, and these things, this is what I recommend. I mean, the people, it's hard to tell your doctor what to do. You might want to find a PCP that's willing to learn about Lyme if you think that you have Lyme disease, or maybe ask around your friends if there is someone locally that, you, um, that you've heard good things about. But these things, a lot of these things can actually be ordered through Quest, which is what I try to do too, and, and mold panels too. I try to order through Quest whenever I can. Next slide. So how to improve your symptoms naturally. This is the part that nobody wants to hear about this because this is Debbie Downer. Like I just, I'm gonna tell you to stop eating sugar and stop eating beer and don't eat pizza because it works. It really does. So I've had a lot of patients, my number one thing, this is all nice, healthy, you know, do nice things for your body. Um, I've had so many patients, I tell most of my patients if I remember, don't eat gluten. Because gluten in and of itself, even if you don't have celiac disease, can be pro-inflammatory. And I've had so many people put it off, put it off, put it off, and then six months into treatment, they say, you know what, I gave up gluten, I feel fabulous. My joints aren't aching anymore, and all of a sudden it's like night and day. So it really can make a huge difference if you think you have Lyme or someone in your family thinks they have Lyme. So diet can make a huge difference. I have a specific anti-inflammatory diet that I prescribe to people, and when they do follow it, it actually can make a big difference. Um, not in everybody, but in a huge uh, number of people. Um, raise your body temperature in any way possible. Exercise, go to a sauna, sweat. Um, there are a number of anti-inflammatory supplements that I did mention before. Um, stress reduction it certainly has an effect on your immune system, an effect on your sleep. Sleep hygiene is important. But people with Lyme disease, they have trouble sleeping and it's not their fault. They do everything right and they just wake up at night. They might wake up with palpitations and it interferes with their, their immune system. Um, and then I also address nutrient deficiencies. This I do see in a lot of my patients. Um, and of course, antibiotics. And before you try any of these at home, definitely consult with your primary care physician or um, another physician that you trust. Next slide. Um, diet, I mentioned gluten, sugar, alcohol, any processed foods. A focus on protein from plants, fish, chicken, limit your red meat, um, increase your vegetables, fruits, seeds, nuts, and um, I, I do prescribe an elimination diet. It's very similar to this. It's just a clean diet and it is sustainable. Some people, it depends on where you're coming from, it can be really, really hard to do. But once you kind of figure out a few little kinks, it's not that bad. Next slide. Um, exercise, absolutely avoid strenuous exercise. I have had a number of people who are marathoners, who are Ironman athletes, who think that because they have lupus or they have psoriatic arthritis, that running a marathon may be good for them. It's the worst thing you can do. It actually increases your um, T helper cells and your IL-17, which stimulates, it, it supports autoimmunity. So that's just, it's the opposite of what you want. Moderate exercise, absolutely. It actually has the effects that you want. Decreases your IL-17 and IL-6. These are cytokines that influence how inflammatory our bodies are. Um, stretching certainly helps, and just like I mentioned before, raise your body temperature, next slide. Um, Anti-inflammatory supplements, I prescribe this to most of my patients. Sometimes I'll throw in ginger or resveratrol. Um, garlic, I haven't really been using, but it's also another nice anti-inflammatory that people can cook with. Um, and thing to note though, with all of these, your eating time can increase, so I would definitely run it by your physician. If you are on other medications, it can actually interfere with those, so next slide. Um, these are some resources um, that I would recommend checking out. Um, I can send you, if you wanted copies of the slides, you can put your name on the back and just make sure you put your email and check off that you'd like slides and so you don't even have to take notes. Next slide. Thank you. 
Um, sorry if that took so long. Was that too long? Okay. Now, does anybody have questions? I had cards in the back for people to write questions. Yeah. And I'll try and um, answer as many as I can. So the question is, do I do pulsing protocols? I do. I absolutely do. And sometimes you have to do it um, based on the patient's response to initial therapy. Sometimes if they have a Herxheimer reaction, sometimes you have to do pulsing. And sometimes, some docs actually do pulsing like once a month. So sometimes you can do pulsing three days a week or you know two out of two days a week. It really is variable and it's almost an art form um, how doctors are starting to come up with these protocols. Any disadvantages to that protocol? It depends on the antibiotic because depending on how quickly the antibiotic washes out of your body or it's metabolized, the pulsing may not do anything. So you want to make sure that, so for example, cephalosporins can have a very short um, half-life in your body, so they're cleared rather quickly. So you can pulse them three days a week. And the goal is you want to kind of kill the bacteria, then pretend that you're gone so that they come out and play again, and then hit them again. And so sometimes people group it together and... Um, disadvantages, I think sometimes it depends on the person. Some people actually do better, and this is just trial and error, um, and you can experiment with different protocols. Even within the same month, you can, you know, with the same patient, you say, listen, if you're not doing well on that, it, their symptoms might actually get worse. Just say, take it every single day for a month and then go to pulsing. So sometimes I'll play around with that. So yeah, I do, I do play around with pulsing quite a bit. I don't know what pulsing is. Oh, so pulsing is, so the traditional thinking when you take antibiotics, most antibiotics you take every single day um, so that the bacteria doesn't have a chance to grow back or develop resistance, for example. But when you have something like this that's slow growing and it's a chronic infection, sometimes you actually get better effects. And I think the researcher was at, um, I'm blanking on the guy's name, he was at um, Tufts. And he, recent, within the past like five years, came up, do you know the guy's name? I forget. Northeastern. Northeastern, is it? Yeah. He's a woman's name and I forget. Kim. Kim, yes. Kim yes. So he actually discovered that you actually had better killing power when you would treat for on and off, and this was in, vi in vitro, right? So in, in dishes, in laboratory. So he had better effect killing on and off, and then they tried it in humans, and they actually found that it actually did have uh, a better effect in some people. Yeah. So, question? Sure, you can, I'll repeat it, I'll repeat it. Um, what is the C4A and C3A test? So C4A, that's a complement test, and that's just a marker of your um, immune systems, uh, the way it's reacting. And depending on the pattern of C3A and C4A, you can kind of differentiate um, whether or not mold is playing a problem here, or, you know, it, there's certain patterns. Um, you can also look at patterns of natural killer cell activity too, like CD57 cells, and you can actually see there are certain characteristic um, depressions of certain subsets that are commonly seen in Lyme disease and, and, and chronic infections like mycoplasma and chlamydia and pneumonia and things like that. And C3A is similar but different? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, sorry, I have a couple other questions. Um, what is the normal range for CD57? CD57? Um, I forget, it's I, basically when I order it, it has a normal range and I, I believe it's, it's a percentage. Um, I don't know it off the top of my hand, I, I forget, but you can see that it's depressed. Yeah. Oh, sorry if I didn't repeat those questions. CD57 range, it's just laboratory dependent. Yeah. Um, do I have any other questions? Okay. What is the last time the CDC updated their guidelines? I believe, you know what, I meant to look that up today because I did mentioned that at my last talk, and I believe it was, I want to say between nine and 12 years ago. It was a long time ago. Um, and I think they're due for another meeting, and that has not happened yet, but it's been quite a while, yeah. So you, you sort of describe lots of symptoms that come about because of this. How many of those symptoms are due to the, the disease, and how many are due to the treatments? So most people, the question is, the, all the list of symptoms that you see here, which are from the disease and which are from the treatment, most of the time when people come see me without having had any treatment, they have those symptoms. So it's from, it's from the disease itself. So like nausea and things like that. Sometimes it can actually get worse with treatment, certainly, but most of the time those are present before you even treat. So it gets 
worse because of the treatment, some reaction to... Sometimes, yes. Yes, in a lot of people. And if that were to happen, then you need to either back off on the dose. The question is, symptoms can get worse. There's a herx summer reaction that occurs with treatment of a number of different... herx summer reaction? Spell yeah. it? No, explain it. Explain it. Oh. Uh, Herxheimer reaction, it's, it's, the official name is Jerish Herxheimer reaction, and it's, it was described a long time ago. It's, um, an, it's an, a robust immune response to a, killing, a dying off of bacteria or yeast or what have you if you have a significant infection in your body. So if someone has um, a very high burden of any kind of bacterium, for example, and you kill them effectively, you can have this very overwhelming surge of cytokines and inflammatory reaction um, that can actually make your symptoms much worse temporarily. Um, for, for Lyme disease um, and some of the co-infections that are chronic and slow growing, the symptoms can actually persist. And even if you have a Herxheimer reaction, typically a Jarish Herxheimer reaction should last about three days to no longer than a week, but for some patients it can actually last longer than that and that's when you need to switch things up if you are treating with antibiotics, you need to back off a little bit and you need to switch the antibiotic, your choice of antibiotic. A question? No? Okay. Is it, I do, actually. Okay. Is this a, a, say you're diagnosed and you had an extended, you, you've had it for a long time and it went un, undiagnosed. Is this something that is like a lifelong I'm on watch? I mean, I know it's, it's... That's a good question. So the question is, is is Lyme disease treatable? Is it curable? Like, can you actually get rid of it? The jury on that is out. There are some people who treat this that believe that it's a matter of getting it suppressed to the level where your immune system can take over, just like Epstein-Barr virus or a number of other bacterial infections that we have in our bodies that are dormant. So the goal is to actually just be symptom free. But you're, that's a good point because you wonder, you know, say you're 40 years old and you treat it and you suppress it, what about when you're 65 and you may get, you know, lymphoma or something and you, or you need immunosuppressives? And what's going to happen then? That's a very good question. So a lot of people do believe that it's just a, a matter of suppressing it. Personally, I'm on the fence. I, I, I'm an optimist, so I believe that because it is a bacterium similar to syphilis. Syphilis, unfortunately, is not treatable because of the sequela, the gumma that it forms in your brain. So it kind of creates this, you know, nasty, the gum-like material in your brain. It's not necessarily, even if you treat it, you're still gonna have the symptoms. But with Lyme disease, the symptoms are pretty much caused by the inflammatory response that you, your body, is making in response to that ongoing, slow, chronic infection. So I personally believe that you can actually get rid of it. So that's the jury's out on that, though. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Do you know if any of these tick-borne diseases can be transferred in vitro? Uh, um, Vertically, in yes. Um, the question is, um, are these tick-borne infections able to be transmitted um, from mother to fetus? And yes, they can be. Um, so that's an area of research that has not happened. And it's something that I really would love to look into. Um, it's probably hard to study. Um, I don't think we know that much about a lot of the co-infections for Lyme disease, absolutely. And if you are pregnant and you have Lyme disease, you should be treated. There are antibiotics that you can take during pregnancy. Yes? The herbal remedies, is that sort of to help with the symptoms or, or is that? That's a good question because some people, the overall feeling in the, the Lyme community is that herbals don't necessarily cure. That's why I personally have a preference for antibiotics because I want to cure. But there are certain people that don't, they can't handle it and they actually do better with just herbals. And it is more of a suppressive thing and they're perfectly happy doing that. And that's, having seen people go through the ups and downs of treatment, sometimes that's actually a better choice for certain patients. So I don't prescribe antibiotics to every single person. Yeah, so it is, the herbals are considered, you know, it's just suppressive. Any other questions? What about the salt and vitamin C protocol? Is that... Salt and vitamin C? Is that a hoax? I don't know what that is. 
Um, it's the treatment of Lyme with a salt regimen. And I've heard it spoken at Ferns and Carlisle um, by Larry and others. So I'm wondering, I haven't seen really much from authoritative sources on it. So I've never heard of it. So the question is, what do I know about the salt and vitamin C protocol? I don't know. I think, is it really, really high doses of vitamin C or something? Is it intravenous? Is it, do you know anything about it? I don't know too much about it. Okay. Um, salt, I do prescribe to a number of my patients and it makes them feel better because um, Lyme disease can suppress your adrenal glands and that can actually make your blood pressure bottom out and so you feel dizzy. Salt can make you feel better almost instantaneously. So I do prescribe that for people and don't take it unless you, you're being seen by a doctor because if you have high blood pressure, you don't want to take salt. Um, but the vitamin C, that's an interesting, uh, some doctors do use. Do you prescribe that for like an adrenal insufficiency? Or salt. Yes, and vitamin C. Oh, okay, vitamin C for and adrenal insufficiency, okay. Like that. Okay, um, I was gonna say, some people use something called a Myers cocktail, which is a vitamin C and um, just a nutrient combination which actually helps boost your immune system and maybe that's similar to, to what you're referring to. I, I'm not familiar with that specific combination. There, there are a lot of things out there that the man in the back. So. You prescribe for the, the film that forms around these little critters, like the grapeseed oil. Um, is, do you take those in combination with an antibiotic or do they do anything on their own? So I do, yeah. And actually, I mean, if you, are you familiar with uh, Stephen Buhner? He, he has like an encyclopedic book with herbals. It's overwhelming how much how many herbal options there are out there. So I only know a little bit and I use that little bit because I know they're safe and I know they didn't interact with drugs. But I personally use them with, I use the herbals with antibiotics. Um, you, can use, you can use multiple herbals together. The only thing I would recommend is if you do choose to use multiple herbals on your own, even if you see an herbalist who does tinctures and makes the things themselves, get your, your kidney function and your liver function and your um, blood counts done by your regular PCP just you know every couple months because you can have um, liver damage from some of these herbals and and I, I monitor all my patients very closely um, with with any of this stuff um, so any other questions are we all set up? the man in the back I just had a comment that the CDC website has really great photographs of the rashes that people get, and the, you know, they start with the bullseye ones and then go into the weirder ones. Mm -hmm. and there aren't that many of them, but my daughter had one that didn't look at all like a Lyme disease rash, but absolutely was. It's right there on the CDC website. Good. It was fantastic. It was horrible. She had Lyme disease. Yeah. It was good that you could see the picture. That's good. Yeah, that's where I got the CDC, uh, the, the attendee was talking about CDC pictures. And um, that's where I got most of my pictures because they're, they're legal and I'm not stealing them from anybody. So yeah, that's a good point. All right, well, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.